Let us all together pray the prayer of for illumination. <clears throat> Living God, help us to hear your holy word that we may truly understand. That understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's scriptures lesson is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 27, verses 41 to 45. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent her for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I will send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Take out your sermon notes with you as we uh, continue to listen to God's word. You know, uh, but before that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God, Lord, we give you all the praise, all honor and all glory. And Lord, this morning we ask once again for your spirit to come and fill our midst. For your spirit to come and speak to us, to minister to us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to deal with the cravings in our lives. For we know, Father God, that these are things that we cannot take lightly. That although many times we think it does not hurt, it does not harm, but it has destroyed much of our lives, much of our potential in you. Help us, therefore, Lord, this, eve, this morning to truly overcome these weaknesses, this temptation, this sinful tendency in our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are in the last part of our series on, the, on cravings. And we were talking about it last week. I mean, not last week, two weeks. Uh, we started about two, two Sundays ago. And we basically, were, uh, for those of you who were not here, all right, we, we, I mentioned that this is not a three part series but this is three parts of one whole sermon so for some of you you may be a bit lost in, this, in what we are talking about today because you didn't hear the first two parts you didn't hear the introduction you didn't hear the main body today we are just wrapping things up all right but just to recap quickly and for those of you who missed it don't forget we always have our youtube channel you can go back there to catch up on what you miss in this series so that you can understand what we are talking about when we are trying to deal with our cravings all right and so what we talked about in the first part we were looking at our cravings and we realized that all of us have cravings you know cravings i'm not just talking about craving for chakwe tiao or craving for durians no but i'm talking about cravings the things in our sinful flesh that is always desiring to do that there's this tendency in us to always want something and we think that by doing it it will satisfy us for, and so for many of us, cravings come in many different forms. For some people, yes, it comes in the form of addiction. Addiction to food, to, to alcohol, to whatever, tobacco. But for some others, it, it, cravings come in the form of the, 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 the extreme e uh, easiness or that the, 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 the pull to always be, to always uh, losing our temper. That, that, that craving for the things of the world, for material wealth, that craving for recognition, that intense craving to be loved by others, to be accepted by people, that craving to be respected by men. You know, and so for all of us, these cravings come in different forms. And what we didn't realize as we saw in the first part of this series is that when we give in to our cravings, many times without realizing, we lose out on the God's potential for our lives. We lose out on what God intends for our lives to be and we don't even realize it. And we trade in, giving in our cravings for something so much greater, which is God's potential. You know, and a good example of that was Esau. When Esau traded 
with Jacob, his brother, Esau traded his potential in God for a bowl of stew. You know, all the promises of God to Jacob would have been Esau's. But Esau traded because he was craving for a bowl of stew. And sometimes we do that in our lives. We trade in for that moment of anger, for that moment of love, for that moment of acceptance, for that moment of, uh, of, of luxury that we just long for, for that moment of pleasure that we desire. We trade that in for uh, relationships that we have, for the friendships that we have, for the ministry that God wants to use us, for the lives that God wants us to touch. We trade all those in for that one bowl of stew. And the challenge that everyone was given was what is your stew? What is your bowl of stew? What is that bowl of stew that you are struggling with? You see, when we saw in the second week, is that you know, for us to start dealing with our cravings, we need to begin to own our cravings. Too often we don't take responsibility for it. We just push it aside. We just, you know, we think it's not harmful, but we need to start taking responsibility for it. We need to own our cravings. We need to say that this craving is mine. This craving is my problem. I need to deal with it. I cannot just let it continue to run loose. And we need to recognize that we are powerless. When it comes to our cravings, very often we are powerless. We say, no, no, I mustn't do this. I don't want to do this. I won't do it again. I won't do it again. And behold, just the next hours or so, we do it again. And we saw that the last few weeks. After service, most of you, you know, after listening to the craving, you say, okay, this is my area of my life. I must stop. I must give up. I must not do that anymore. I must not give in to my anger anymore. I must not give in to my frustration, to my depression, to my hatred, to my unforgiveness, to whatever it is. I say, I will give it up. But after when I go home, when I leave the sanctuary somehow, it just happens again. I just give in. Why? Because that's the power of cravings. It's powerful. We can come here, we can worship, tears can fall from our eyes, we can weep before the Lord, we can surrender our lives before Him, we can do all those things, and then yet, when we go home, our cravings come up again. Because it is that powerful. And to own it, we need to recognize that it's powerful. We need to start taking responsibility for it. And we ended the last sermon by saying that we know we need to start cutting off temptations. We need to cut off all temptations. You know, and you know, whatever temptation it is that, that, that causes us to, to delios our craving in, we need to cut it off. There are temptations that we cannot cut off, and there are those that spring on us unexpectedly, yes. But whatever that we can cut off, we need to cut off those temptations. We need to start cutting off those temptations. And it start by owning it. But the biggest problem is this, you know. Is that I still crave. Isn't that true? No matter what temptation I cut off, I still crave. Because it just doesn't mean that if I cut off the temptations and I say, okay, don't think about it. Don't think about it. Don't do it. Don't think about it. You know, I exercise my willpower not to think about it, not to do it. We begin to realize it ain't enough. It ain't enough. Like just trying to use my willpower alone to stop my craving, to tell myself, don't do it, don't give in, don't give in, don't think about it, don't do it. It doesn't work. Don't believe me. Okay, let me do an experiment. I want all of you here, right? everybody, don't look left, don't look right. Everyone, close your eyes. Everyone, just listen to what I want to say. Close your eyes. Everybody, close your eyes. Down here, up there, or close your eyes. Alright, now listen to me carefully. Listen very carefully. Do not imagine a purple cow. Do not, do not imagine a purple cow. Do not picture a purple cow. Do not see the purple cow. Okay, open your eyes, everyone. How many of you saw a purple cow? How many of you imagine a purple cow? How many of you see a purple cow flash before your eyes? It doesn't work, okay? Willpower alone will never work because that's how it is. The more we don't want to think about it, 
The more we pretend it is not there, the more we try to ignore it, the stronger and stronger it gets, the more we want to do it. And that is just human nature. That's why when you go to the shopping complex and you see some, uh, some delicious thing, you think of oh, the delicious donuts over there or, 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 or uh, a cheesecake, okay? The bakery is selling some nice cheesecake and you pass by and say, okay, okay, don't go near, don't go near. The cheesecake is over there. You go the opposite direction. But as, as you are going there, you're shopping, buying chocolate. You're buying chocolates, you see? Why the chocolate look like cheesecake one, huh? Then you put, you buy vegetable, the pumpkin. The pumpkin looks like the shape of a cheesecake. And everything, you're all thinking about the cheesecake. And before you can realize it, you are back there where the cheesecake is being so because the more you try not to think of it the more you think about it and that's how craving works in fact let's just look at the bible all right in james chapter 1 verse 14 to 15 this explains to us how cravings works and let, let, let's just put it up on the board let's put it on the screen let's all read this together all right all together with one loud wesley voice one two go but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You see, it starts with where? It starts with the desire. The thing in us that craves for it, the thing in us that longs for it, and then we just fall, it just, it just births forth this desire in us. Let me diagram this whole process for you. Lah. Okay? How does temptation work? Well, it first always begins. Here, the next slide. The next slide, please. All right. For the process of temptation, it always begins with the thought. It begins with a thought. The thought comes into my mind I want this. I need this. I like this. I want to do it. The thought comes in. Like if you pass by a cheesecake bakery, you see a cheesecake selling there, and the thought comes into your mind Ooh. There's cheesecake. Cheesecake is delicious. The thought comes into your mind. I want to have cheesecake. The thought comes in. And once the thought comes in, the next thing that happens in our mind is it goes into our imagination. We begin to imagine, ooh, how delicious that cheesecake looks like. And you begin to imagine the taste of that cheesecake as it goes into your mouth. You imagine the smell. And you imagine the taste when your tongue touches the cake and it just melts all over your mouth and you can feel the cheese filling every corner of your mouth and you swallow it. Ah, you imagine. Wow. That's how it works. We imagine. And after we imagine, what happens next is we begin to justify. Well, I've been so good. I've been on a diet for the last 10 days. I deserve a cheesecake. I haven't eaten cheesecake for one year. I deserve it. After all, one cheesecake won't kill you, right? If I eat the whole cake, it will kill me. But one slice won't kill me. After all, I work so hard to earn all this money. Can't I enjoy a little bit of it? My wife is not around to see. Never mind. You know, we justify it. And we tell ourselves, it is okay. Then after that, we make the choice. We make the choice. Rather than moving this way, we make the choice to turn around and go to the cheesecake shop. And once we reach the cheesecake shop, we make the act. And that's the sin. We commit. Okay, eating cheesecake is not a sin. Lah, huh? But giving in to your cravings, that's where it hits us. That's where it hits. And you see, this whole process, it can happen in a split second, or it can happen over a year, a week, a day. It can happen over days. Over hours, it depends. Sometimes we will wrestle with it for months. We wrestle, yes, I should, yes, I shouldn't, no, I should, I shouldn't, and we justify why we should. We try to say we shouldn't, and we justify until finally we do it. And that's what we do. And sometimes it, it, it's the same process for anything. Sometimes we, we are not supposed to look at things in the internet that we shouldn't be looking at. But somehow there's this craving in us. And when we come across, when we are on, surfing the internet, suddenly the thought comes to us, hey, when are you going to click on that website? And you straight away say, no lah, I shouldn't. I'm a good Christian boy. I shouldn't. But I just imagine, I wonder what is in that website. And I imagine the things that I would have seen. And the things that I could have seen. And the things that I would like to see. And I imagine all those pictures. And then I say, well, nobody knows. 
It's just between me and the computer. Nobody knows. After all, it's just pictures. Pictures doesn't hurt. Nothing happens. I'm not doing anything wrong. And then we make a choice to click that button. And once we click that button, we have done it. Same thing with anger. Sometimes something happened and we just, a thought just comes to our mind and say, how wish is it? How nice I can just give him a piece of my mind. Just give him my piece of my mind. And I begin to imagine, ooh, how nice it is uh, when I say this to him and then his face turns black and then he feels so hurt and he runs away crying and I feel so happy about it. How nice is it to just unload all this off my chest that when I throw all this on him, I will feel so lightened and so free. I will feel so happy, so justified. And we imagine it. And then we justify. After all, he deserves it. He did this or he did that. He's, I'm the grief party. I'm the one that's being hurt. I'm the one that's being, being bullied. I should defend myself. After all, it's right for me to defend myself. Why should I be stepped over? I should be what? I, I mean, I should protect myself. I should protect my heart, my feelings, my emotions. And we justify. Then we make the choice. And we open our mouth. And we say the things that we shouldn't say. Or we do the things we shouldn't do. And, it, and that's how the cycle repeats itself. Over and over and over again. And so you see, what happens is, it all starts in the mind. It all starts in the mind. It starts with that thought. It starts with that thought. It starts in the mind. In fact, would you write with me the first point of your notes is this, that cravings doesn't start in the act, but in the mind. Cravings doesn't start in the act, but in the mind. And it ends with the act. You see, many times for us, why we find it so difficult to deal with cravings is because we think cravings is only manifest in the act itself. We think that everything else before that is not craving. That everything else before that is innocent. It's only the act that where I sin. It's the act that where I struggle. It's the act that I should not do. Everything else is okay. And so we think that normally, normally that when we go around, we, 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 uh, we go to the supermarket, go back to my cheesecake story, okay? In case you don't get the hint, pastor loves cheesecake, all right? All right, so instead I'm back in the supermarket. I'm pushing the, the, the trolley and I know the cheesecake shop is over there. I can see the smell coming out of it and I push away. And we think that it is craving only happens. The sin only happens when I turn around and I buy the cheesecake and I put it in my mouth. And we think that is the point of craving. But friends, that is not the point. That's the end process of craving. The whole process of craving started when I think about it. When I think about the cake. When I think about eating the cheesecake. And I can imagine it. And I can imagine the taste. I can even taste it on my tongue. The whole process has started. And the problem for many of us is this. We wait. We wait until we are at the doorstep of the cheesecake shop and we are holding the money in our hands and we are saying, no, 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 don't buy, don't buy. And we try to pull our hands in, don't buy, don't buy, don't eat. And we think and we struggle at that point. That's the point we struggle in. But friends, that's ne- that will never work. If you struggle at that point, you've already given in, you're already dead, you're already gone. It is at the thought when you need to arrest the problem. It is when the thought comes, when you're trying to imagine it, when you're trying to justify it, even before you try to justify, don't even try to imagine it. Because once the devil catches you in that point, you have lost the battle. You have lost the battle for your craving. You have given in to your craving. And that's what happened to Esau. Remember the the, the Esau? I mean, you know, he, he sold his birthright to Jacob, right? He's already sold the birthright to Jacob. But then even after that, many, many years later, this, this happened many years later, when Jacob then came and uh, pretended to be Esau and the father blessed Jacob instead of Esau. But you see what is, how did Esau introduce himself to the father? In Genesis 27, 32, and his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. You see, even many, many years after that, Esau was still referring to himself as the firstborn. Yeah, he is still the firstborn. No one can change that fact. But he has sold his birthright. He has sold the birthright away. So by right, whatever blessings that comes with that birthright 
ain't his anymore. It ought to be his brother's. It ain't his. But all these years, he was telling himself, no, it is still my birthright. I am still the firstborn. It still belongs to me. I still deserve it. That guy stole it from me. It still belongs to me. It still belongs to me. When in reality, he never, Jacob never stole anything. He sold it free, free will, freely. He sold it freely. But all these years, his mind is still thinking, I'm the firstborn. I deserve this. I deserve this. I deserve my father's blessing. I deserve all this because I'm the firstborn. I'm the firstborn. But he has forgotten. He has sold his birthright. He has sold it away. And when all things, when all after, after that, you know, when the whole thing happened, after uh, Jacob stole the uh, blessing from him and he, Esau found out, Verse 41, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her elder son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. And in fact, the story goes on. Rebecca says, told Jacob, you better go away. Go and hide somewhere else until the day your brother is not angry anymore. Then I will call you back. And we know Rebecca never called Jacob back. That means the brother was still angry. And in fact, the father haven't died yet. The father died much later, which means Jacob was still, I mean Esau was still angry. And he held that grudge. He held that thought of killing that idea that thought of killing because for Esau's mind is if I kill Jacob he can imagine how satisfied he would be how avenged he would have felt how great he would have felt that this is what I've done I've I've, I've seek justice for myself and so we have to realize friends that cravings begins not in the act but it always starts in the mind in the mind and this is where we need to control. This is where we need to deal with our cravings. This is where we need to arrest our cravings. This is where we need to, 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 to wrestle with in terms of our cravings. And that is why willpower alone will never do. Willpower alone will never help us overcome our craving. Because as you have experienced, if you, no matter how much you try not to think of a purple cow, you will still think of a purple cow. Willpower alone does not help. And that's why you can understand why Paul, Paul the Apostle, he was one of the greatest apostles in the Bible. He was the one who brought the gospel to all the nations. He was the one who, if not for Paul, none of us would exist today. That's how great Paul was. And Paul has done miracles. Paul has form doctrines. In fact, most of what the church understands today is because of how God spoke through Paul. In fact, one third two, two, of the New Testament is written by Paul, the apostle. And this same Paul, he actually struggles. That's why he says when he talks about craving, he struggles. He says in Romans seven nineteen, For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. In fact, friends, you can change that word to whatever your craving is. For the, for the diet that I will to do, I do not diet. But the cheesecake which I will not to eat, that I eat. You know, put it in. Put what you're craving in. Personalize this scripture and you can understand what Paul is trying to say. Alright, and so Paul is saying, For the good that I will not do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Verse 27, I find then a law that evil, that evil is present with me, that cravings is present. Personalize it, friends. That, that craving to score, that, that desire to, 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 to be envious, that desire to, for materialism, that desire for whatever it is, is with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. My spirit longs for God. There's something in me that wants to follow God, that wants to obey His commands, that wants to be a good follower of God, not one who gives in to temptation, who gives in to anger, who gives in to all these negative things, but one who truly pleases God. In my inward man, I want to follow the law of God. 
verse 33, but I see another law in my members, another law in my body, another force, another power in me, warring against the law of my mind. Remember, that's where it starts. That's where craving starts, in my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. It's so powerful. This force in me, this desire in me is so powerful. This desire for evil, to do the things that I know I don't want to do, that I shouldn't do. This desire is so strong, it battles against my mind and it brings me into captivity. In other words, Paul is saying, I lose. That's what Paul is saying. In conclusion, Paul is saying, I lose. I try to fight. I try to resist. But the law of the flesh overpowers me and I lose. In verse 24, Paul says this, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's his conclusion. After saying all these things, Paul is saying, that's how wretched I am. Paul, the greatest apostle, the greatest follower of Jesus Christ, the, great, the person who wrote half the New Testament, the person who brought the gospel to you and I, to everyone in the world, says, Oh, what a wretched man I am. He recognized, Paul recognized how difficult it is to deal with the cravings, that he alone cannot deal with it. And sometimes I think about us, uh, we think we are so great, you know, we think that I am. Uh, no problem, lah. This one I can change, lah. I can overcome, lah. I can deal with it. We think we are have we have the strength to do it, but even the apostle Paul says he doesn't, and he says, "Oh wretched man am I, who will deliver me from this body of death?" Good thing he didn't end there. I thank God that Paul didn't end the scripture there. He goes on to say in verse twenty-five, "I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord." Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. You see the difference? It is Jesus who would bring. It's only through the power of Jesus can our minds begin to serve the law of God. And our flesh will still crave, but our minds will now overrule the flesh. That's why there's no other way out of our cravings other than Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important. If there's any of you here sitting here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ, or you have never given that, taken that step to say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. To taken that step to say, Jesus, you know, I know I, I've been putting you at an arm's length. I, somehow I've been wrestling with you all this while. I've been putting you at an arm's length. And sometimes you wonder why is it that certain things just doesn't work out for you. It, because it's time for you to take that step to accept Jesus in your heart. To ex- allow Him in your heart. Because God knows that's the only way. And that's why God, Jesus, I mean, Paul, Paul says again in 1 Corinthians 10 13, he says this no temptation, no cravings, no desire of the flesh has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Okay, whatever you're facing, whatever cravings you're facing is not that unique, it's common. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But listen carefully first, listen carefully, listen carefully. But with the temptation, with the cravings, with the desire, with the longing to sin, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He will make a way of a way of escape, an escape route, a way out, so that you can bear it. You can overcome it. In other words, friends, there is always a way out. Whatever your cravings are today that you're struggling with, it can be a lifelong craving, there is a way out. Whatever that you are fighting over day in, day out, willpower alone cannot overcome, discipline alone cannot overcome, there is a way out. And what is that way out? What is that way out? James 4, 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In other words, friends, that's the way out. That's the way out. You want the devil to flee from you? 
you want the devil to flee from you, then all you have to do is submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's that simple. In fact, you can write the second point of your notes is this. Submit to God, then resist the devil. Not the other way around. Not the other way around. Sometimes we get things reversed, you know. Sometimes we, we, we resist the devil and then we submit to God. No. Submit to God and then resist the devil. Not the other way around. You know, sometimes we try, we think that we do things in reverse, it's just the same results. It doesn't work, you know. I remember one time I was in PJ, you know PJ, yeah? uh, we have this parking system when you park cars, you know like your Malacca, you have coupons, scratch, 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 scratch the coupon to pay your parking fees, right? Uh, in PJ, our system is, <coughs> they have a machine where you go to the machine, you put your coins in, key in your number plate, and they will give you a ticket to say that you have paid the parking for this parking lot. All right, those of you who have been to PJ, you know how it works, right? And when they first started the system, all right, when they first started this system, I remember the process was very simple. The process was, you put in your coins, you key in the number, and then you press the green button. The ticket comes out. So that's how it works. All over the place, that's how it works. And so I begin to do it automatically. Put in the coins, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, press the button, get the ticket. One day I was going to this new section of PJ where the machines were a bit newer than normal. I didn't realize they were so new. And I parked my car and I went to the machine and I did the same thing. Put the coins in, tick, 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 press the button. Nothing happens. I checked, all my coins fell out. I tried again, put the coins in, tick, 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 nothing happened. And the machine was just right in front of the car. So I said, okay, fine. This machine must be broken. Look down the road, look for another machine. Went, walk quite a distance to the next machine. Do the same thing. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Nothing happened. Went to another machine. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Nothing happens. And then lo and behold, I saw another couple, a guy, went back to the same machine that I was using. Tick, 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 tick. He got a ticket. And by then, I was fuming mad. I said, what's wrong with this machine? And when I went back to that machine, I tried again, nothing happens. Until I finally look at the instructions. And for some reason, for this particular machine here, in that area, the instruction was, you key in your number plate first, then you put in the coins. And so I did that, so I key in the number plate, I put in my coins, and it finally worked. <laughs> You know, and I was so frustrated, I just wasted my entire, I don't know how many minutes, walking up and down under the hot sun, just trying to figure it out how it works. And sometimes they say, just because we don't read the instructions. And the Bible says very clearly, submit to God, then resist the devil. But many times we reverse it, and we think in my life, you know, I'm not worthy of God, so what I need to do is I need to resist the devil. If I resist the devil and I've overcome all these cravings, then I will be a good Christian. I will follow God fully. I can follow this. I can do this for God. I can become this. It doesn't work that way, friends. We, it, it doesn't work in reverse. You don't try to resist the devil. You don't try to overcome your cravings, try to get over whatever you're struggling with, and then you submit to God. You follow God. No. It starts by you submit to God, and then you resist the devil. You see, because it's simply, simply this. Because if we never submit to God, let's just say, example, you have a problem with anger. Your craving is anger. And if you never submit to God, you'll always be an angry man. Because remember, the only person who can save you from your craving is who? Jesus Christ. As Paul said, oh, wretched man I am. It's only through Jesus can I overcome my cravings. And so if I never submit to God, and if my, daily, my craving is anger, I'm always an angry man. And no matter how much I resist the devil, it's an angry man trying to resist being angry. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. But until and unless you submit to God, then you will have the right source, you have the right energy to then resist the devil. Because the power to resist the devil comes not from your willpower, but from your relationship with God. Whether are you plugged into the right source? You know, it's like that time I was using this kind of hot plate. You know the hot plate or not? 
those, those things that you go to, sometimes those electric stove, not those inductive stove, you know, those old electric stove where it's, there's a heater element, it's a hot plate kind of stove. There was one time we were, I can't remember where we were, I think we were in some hotel or some, some foreign place. And so we had this hot plate and we were trying to boil some water to, I think to, 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 to boil some water lah, to make, can't remember, lah, make soup or something like that. And so we started boiling the water. We put it on, we switched it on, everything. We weren't very really sure if it was working or not. But I think it was working. And then we put it on, we put the water on, and we waited for so long, the water just couldn't boil. We poured, the, say, it feels hot, feel like, eh? you feel like it's a bit hot or not hot. You think it is hot, but somehow it's not boiling. And then so you put the sauce, the powder in, and you keep stirring the powder. I say maybe stir more. Lah. Keep stirring, stirring, stirring. It just doesn't dissolve. It just doesn't melt. And we're trying that for about half an hour, just trying to get it to, to heat up. And we're wondering what's wrong with this pot. Until we realize that the plug was not plugged in to a working power supply. It was plugged into a plug, but that sauce was not the right sauce. And when we plug into another sauce, within minutes, the thing was, was boiling. Same thing. When we try to resist the devil and we're not plugged in, to the right source, it will never work. It will never work. And so when God says, serve, I want you to serve, you start serving. You don't wait until you overcome your cravings, until you become such a nice, pleasant person and you start serving. No. But it's when you submit to God and you begin to serve and it's in the midst of that submission that you begin to, get, you begin to receive the power to overcome the cravings that you have in your life. And so when God says, do your devotions, do your journaling, pray, spend time in prayer, come to church, worship, all those things, those are important. Why? Because when you submit to God, then He gives you the strength to overcome your cravings. It's when you submit to God, then you will have the strength to resist the devil. That's why Romans 8, 5 says this, For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You see how important it is? If you want to deal with, overcome your cravings, you, can, you must stop living in the flesh. Because when you continue to live in the flesh, you will walk, your minds will always be set on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, your minds will always be set on the Spirit. So would you write with me the last point of your notes is this. May I encourage all of you? Learn to crave God and the things of God. Learn to crave God and the things of God. You see, friends, craving is, a, is, is something that is wired in our DNA. God designed us to be people that has this desire in us, these cravings in us. God designed us that way. That's why human beings have such strong cravings. Because God designed us that way. We, we have craving for food, otherwise we'll die of starvation. We have craving to, to marry and have children, otherwise the population would die out. There's this craving that's built in us. But you see, what God intended for good, sin has distorted. The devil has distorted. And the devil has made it something that is evil, something that is destructive, something that is detrimental to us. But as much as we, we want to, we can still make that craving for good. We can still use that craving for good. And that is by channeling that cravings, channeling that desire, channeling all that energy, that longing for something, and channeling it to God. Channeling it to God and the things of God. Can you imagine how different your life would be? If that strong desire you have for your craving, whatever it is, that strong desire was channeled to God and the things of God, can you imagine how powerful your life would be? Can you imagine <coughs> that, you know, instead of desiring uh, cheesecakes, you're always thinking about God instead. And you pass by a church and you just pass by the church and you're struggling. Ayo, I don't want to go to church. Lah. I already went to church this morning. But cannot. Lah. There's this desire to want to worship God. There's this longing to want to go and worship God. And so even though you're walking away from the church, you know there's a church service going on. There's something inside you saying, no, 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 no. Go and worship God. Go and worship God. And this craving, this longing, you just turn around and you just want to worship God. 
Can you imagine uh, that power in your life that when you sit down and you watch TV and you say, I want to watch TV. And when you're on the TV, suddenly there's a, this strength in you say, no, 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 no. There's this desire to read the Word of God, to spend time in devotion rather than watching TV. And there's this craving in you that say, no, I want to worship. I want to read the Word. I don't want to watch TV. You know, I'm going to watch TV. It's so boring. I, the Word of God is so much more interesting. And this strong desire to spend time in His Word to spend time in devotion, to spend time in prayer, to draw close to God. Can you imagine when you're on the computer and you're clicking, clicking, you're looking at Facebook, oh, you must look at Facebook, and you look no face, you know how discouraging Facebook is, right? The more you look at Facebook, the more discontented you feel about life. And so we are looking at Facebook, and then there's this longing in you, they say, no, 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 I don't, want to, I don't want to waste time in Facebook. You know, instead of clicking on the Facebook, I will click on the Bible app and read the Bible and, li- and listen to devotion and listen to spiritual songs because there's a craving for it. There's a longing for it. And friends, let me tell you, friends, that is the only way you will overcome your cravings. When you switch your cravings from a bowl of stew to something that is so much greater, like God. And that's why I say this, the title of this sermon is Focus on Steak Rather Than Stew. Because let me tell you, friends, no matter how delicious a stew is, when you can have something more delicious, you ain't going to bother about stew. You ain't going to bother about stew. When you're going to pass by something that is more delicious, more enticing, you ain't going to bother about stew. And the only thing that, you can, that can be more enticing is God. And we need to learn to make that switch in our mind, to start craving the things of God. Because when we start craving the things of God, like what Romans 8 says, you know, we begin to walk in the Spirit. And when we walk in the Spirit, we ain't going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're, going to, we're not walking in the flesh. That's why uh, Galatians 5.16 says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you begin to walk in the Spirit, when you begin to crave the things of God, and God is always on your mind, and, and you're just in love with God, in love with the Word of God, with the power of God, with the presence of God, and your mind is just filled with that day in, day out, day in, day out. Friends, there is no room for your cravings. There is no enticement. Your cravings no longer entice you because you crave something greater. You crave something more powerful that is God. I just want to close with my own story. <clears throat> I'm, going to be, I'm going to be rather transparent with you guys this morning. You know, when I was growing up in my university, in my, in my secondary and university days, I think I've shared with some of you before, one of the biggest struggles I go through is a struggle with pornography. All right, and there's, I'm, there's no secret. It's, I'm being transparent with you guys, but that's one of my biggest struggles in my co- university, my schooling days. And I came to know Christ fully in my university days. That's when I truly was born again and I came to know Jesus. And in the first few years, I was serving Him. I was, you know, getting involved in church, worshipping and all this. But in the back of, in the back, back of my life, there was this dark secret that I'm still struggling with. This area of my life that I'm still wrestling with, that I just can't seem to overcome. And, I, and, it began, and I was so condemned, I feel so guilty about it, I feel so bad about it. You know, it was so bad to the point that when I come to church, you know, or I go to prayer meetings and I, you know, you, 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 don't, you, can't look at, you can't look at people from the opposite side in a very healthy way. In fact, it was so bad to the point that I can even dream about it. You know, I was, uh, and I tried all sorts of things to overcome. I said, no, I have to deal with this. I have to deal with this issue. I just can't go on as a Christian trying to follow God at the same time trying to do all this. And every time I come to God, I come to worship Him, I would feel so, so, so unclean or so impure that I just can't worship Him fully. I just can't, can't truly surrender my life to Him. And so I keep trying to resist. So I tried all sorts of things. I tried going for deliverance. I tried, you know, you know something about deliverance is this. I believe in deliverance, but not everything is from the devil, you know. Some things are from the devil, but some things are from us, and we need to deal with it. All right, so there's, there's, no, there's no quick solution. You know, sometimes we like, we, like, we, like, we like to go to deliverance. We like to have those kind of quick solutions. Pastor, lay hand on you, snap your finger, poop, craving gone. 
And so I was seeking all that. I went to every preacher, I went to every evangelist, I went to every revival meeting, just hoping for that magical touch, lay hands, snap the finger, everything goes away. I went for, I even uh, started uh, doing everything. I started cut off all temptations, delete everything from the computer, burn everything I have, delete everything, clear, clean cut. But it just doesn't stop. It just comes back. There's always avenues. There's always loopholes. There's always ways to find it back again. I even went to go fasting. I even tried fasting and I fasted for weeks. Not days, weeks. And it still doesn't work. It still doesn't work. Until I came to a point in my life when I told God, okay, fine, let it be. Lah. If I just can't, I, I know I'm tired, I just don't know what to do anymore. It came to a point in my life when I said, okay, I'm going to ignore this part for a while. And I want to get my life with God right. And I begin to build my relationship with God. I begin to delve deeper in the Word. I begin to enjoy God. I begin to read His Word. I begin to worship Him. I begin to serve Him even more. And I begin to learn, you know, like what Psalms, the psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord. And I begin to learn to delight myself in God. To delight myself in worship. To delight myself in reading His Word. And to delight myself in God. And the more I, I realize suddenly, and I begin to realize... The more I grow here, the more I delight myself in God here, the more I enjoy the presence of God, the more I enjoy the things of God, the more I enjoy the love of God, the Word of God, the more I grow here, the weaker the pool cup is over here. The weaker the temptation is over here. The weaker the hold it has on me over here. And the more I enjoy, the more I I, I lost myself in the, in, the, in the presence of God, the more I, I, I find myself you know, in the ecstasy of worship, the more I, I, I delve and I love God, the more I enjoy, the lesser and the weaker this becomes. And it's just a matter of time when this no longer has its hold over my life. Yeah, it's still, a, it's still an area of my life that I need to watch out for. Like everybody else that's overcoming cravings, there's always an area, you must always be vigilant. You must always be vigilant. But it no longer has that pool it used to have. It no longer has that strength it used to have. Why? Because I've made that switch. I've made that switch. From craving something of the flesh, I've learned to channel that energy of craving to God and the things of God. And likewise, friends, if you want to overcome your cravings, the only way, the only way to fully overcome is not just to discipline yourself. It's important to discipline, but it's to begin to crave God and the things of God. And when you do that, then you'll be truly like it says, you will walk in the Spirit and you shall no longer fulfill the desire of the flesh you'll begin to have victory over your cravings. And that which seems impossible will now be possible because you begin to crave God and the things of God. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise. <coughs> all honour and all glory. And Lord, this morning we ask once again, Lord, for your strength to help us to overcome our cravings. Lord, many times we just, we try to struggle with our strength, with our own will. But we've never learned to rely on you. Help us, Lord, to learn that the only way for us to overcome our cravings is to make that switch in our hearts and in our minds. Not just to stop craving what we shouldn't crave, but to start craving you and your word and your presence and your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be people. People who are not ruled by our cravings, but people who overcome our cravings and people who crave you and you alone. Lord, I just commit each and every one of us here unto your hands. Help us, Lord, by your blood, 
by the blood that was shed on the cross so that we now can be a people who can crave you rather than the world, rather than the flesh. Help us, Lord, to be people who crave you and your word. Hallelujah. Lord, I just commit all of us here to your hands. Continue to do that work in us, Holy Spirit. Continue to effect that change in our lives. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.